You speak a language because you need to. And if your language is becoming the world language, do you need to? Does, the, does language color our world view? This is the question. Or does our world view color our language? Oh, deep, huh? How many of you grew up seeing those tall leafy things called trees and only later grew to appreciate them and their individual qualities when you learnt their names? Perhaps when your children were in kindergarten, that's when you learnt all the names of all the different trees? Is it the language that created your view of the trees? Or the fact that the different trees needed to be named that created the language? This is the bit where I give the lecture, the intellectual bit, okay? Happens in every, every conference. The Sapir-Whorf theory, named after the American linguists, Edward Sapir and Benjamin Lee Whorf, argued that language colors our worldview. In 1929, Sapir argued in a classic passage, a classic, this is what everybody quotes, human beings do not live in the objective world alone, nor alone in the world of social activity as ordinarily understood but are at the very mercy of the particular language which has become the medium of expression for their society. What he's saying is that we see the world through our language. It is quite an illusion, he continues, to imagine that one adjusts to reality essentially without the use of language and that language is merely an incidental means of solving specific problems of communication or reflection. The fact of the matter is that the real world is to a large extent unconsciously built upon the language habits of the group. It goes back to a little bit about what Greg Nathan said to us, when reality meets perception, it's perception that wins. No two languages are ever sufficiently similar to be considered as representing the same social reality. The worlds in which different societies live are distinct worlds not merely the same worlds with different labels attached. We see and hear and otherwise experience very largely as we do because the language habits of our community predisposes certain choices of interpretation. Wolf went on to say something very similar. He said, we dissect nature along lines laid down by our native languages. The categories and types that we isolate from the world of phenomena, we do not find there because they stare every observer in the face. On the contrary, the world is presented in a kaleidoscopic flux of impressions which has to be organized in our minds, largely by the linguistic systems in our minds. Here's an example of language and world perception. Ooh, I'm sure that Greg could help us with this. This is in, this is a people called the Gugu Timitir language speakers of Cape York Peninsula in northeastern Australia. They're Aborigines and they don't have words for left, right, front or back. It's obvious to us that we have to have words for left, right, front and back, but they don't have them. When they refer to people or obje objects in their environments, they use compass directions. They would say, I'm standing southwest of my sister. Or I'm standing to the, well, they wouldn't say I'm standing left of my sister, I'm standing southwest of my sister. Critics of the Sapir Wharf hypothesis point out that Aborigines who speak this language usually also learn English and can use left, right, front and back just as we do. However, if they do not learn English during early childhood, they would have difficulty in orientating themselves relatively and absolute orientation makes more sense to them. Children learn language as members of a speech community which lays down rules for appropriate use of language. As children learn a language, they also learn their culture and develop their cognitive abilities. So, does a world speaking English color the world, way people think? And if so, how and to what extent? I, is it moral to want everyone to speak a high level of English and from an early age? 
Is there a difference in the way the world is viewed between the person who learned English before the age of seven or the person who learned as a teenager and older? Does English belong to a particular culture today or is English a world culture, a world language with many cultures? Clearly, these are all relevant and important questions. We don't have the time to examine the multitude of directions that can emanate from what I'm saying. I'm simply quote, posing the questions as food for thought. Yes, we are introducing another worldview alongside that which the child already has. Is multiculturalism healthy? I would argue very much so, especially when introduced before the age of seven, when the child's brain is still growing and in maximum plasticity. Indeed, many of us who move to live in another country in our 20s or 30s may learn to appreciate the different aspects of the new cultures around us, but we often find that we remain outsiders. Just as the only, language, uh, the only age in which a language can be learned as a mother tongue is by immersion up to the age of seven, indeed, a certain window of opportunity remains until the age of 10 also, I believe this is true of learning a culture too. Indeed, language and culture are inextricably interwoven. The EU white paper, that's the European Union white paper on teaching and training in 1995 wrote, languages are also the key to knowing other people. Proficiency in languages helps to bring up the feeling of being European with its cultural wealth and diversity and of understanding between the citizens of Europe. Learning languages, I'm still qu quoting from the white paper, the EU white paper 1995. Learning languages also has another important effect. <clears throat> Experience shows that when undertaken from a very early age, it's an important factor in doing well at school. This is the EU, 1995. Contact with another language is not only compatible with becoming proficient in one's mother tongue, it also makes it easier. It opens the mind, stimulates intellectual agility, and of course expands people's cultural horizon. The EU white paper goes on to say, multilingualism is part and parcel of both European identity, citizenship, and the learning society. And, they say, in order to make for proficiency in three community languages, it is desirable for foreign language learning to start at preschool level. 1995. And, this, and they've taken it further. But first another quote. One day in heaven, the Lord decided that he would visit the earth and take a stroll. Walking along the road, he encountered a man who was crying. The Lord asked the man, why are you crying, my son? The man said that he was blind and had never seen a sunset. The Lord touched the man who could then see and was happy. As the Lord walked further, he met another man crying and asked, Why are you crying, my son? The man was born a cripple and was never able to walk. The Lord touched him and he could walk and he was happy. Farther down the road, the, man met a ma the Lord met a man who was crying and asked, Why are you crying, my son? The man said, Lord, I work for the school system. The Lord sat down and cried with him. <laughs> Why should children start learning foreign languages before school? The EU has launched the Picolingo campaign, I think it was this year or last year, aimed at particularly at parents and seeking to raise awareness about the fact that young children who start learning languages at a very early age will confidently approach foreign languages and cultures. And their goals are very much the same as ours. Making communication easier, learning and memorizing through play, which is a good preparation for school, learning to be open-minded, feeling at home in any country, increasing their chances of finding a job, finding foreign cultures alluring rather than threatening and appreciating their own culture. We preach tolerance. We are speaking about knowledge. We are speaking of citizens of the world who are not limited to one culture or one language. 
We are speaking of citizens of the world who have many languages and many cultures. And the question remains, can English serve many cultures? Can English express many cultures? And what is English? We are standing at an unprecedented time in history where we are about to experience one agreed upon world language of communication, English. How did this come about? Some of the history is a dubious colonial past that left enormous countries such as India and, and with English as a lingua franca. However, that in itself would not have been a reason. With the USA and the UK emerging strongly in the middle of the last century after the last world war, the influence of English started to grow. It is well known that in order to want to learn a language, you have to want to be associated with that culture. People want to be associated with the language that is looked upon as having a higher social status. Of course, if this language can help them communicate worldwide, get better jobs and improve their social status, way to go.